Good morning. Good morning. The Lord be with you. Welcome to God's house on this fifth Sunday in the season of Lent. We're deep into the Lenten journey. We often use that word to describe the season of Lent because a number of our scripture readings and this morning's gospel is among those. Focus us on Jesus and his disciples as they journey to Jerusalem, uh, as they head down from Nazareth and uh, head to the holy city uh, to celebrate the Passover. And this morning, uh, we will hear uh, a reading from that journey. And uh, that reading is going to all be all about ambition. We all have ambitions, uh, goals that we would like to achieve, things that are important to us that we want to accomplish in life. Uh, Jesus' disciples were no exception. Uh, they had ambitions. But our ambitions, their ambitions, all must be shaped by the ambitions of Christ. And uh, this morning, uh, we're going to hear His ambition for our lives. So welcome, welcome to God's house today. If you're here in the church, uh, we're going to use our hymnals this morning. There are a limited number of uh, printed orders of service. If that is easier for you, the ushers can uh, get you one of those if there are any left. Um, but uh, for the majority of us, we will use the hymn book this morning. If you'd like to place ribbons uh, in the order of service, uh, we're using Divine Service Setting 3. It begins on page 184. Uh, because it's a season of Lent, we omit some parts of the liturgy. I'll announce uh, page numbers as we move through. Uh, for those of you who are online, don't worry about the hymnal, uh, unless you have one at home and you want to use it, that's great. Um, but uh, all the words to the hymns, the liturgy, and everything else will appear on the screen as the service unfolds uh, this morning. So, again, welcome uh, to God's house as we gather this fifth Sunday in Lent. Our opening hymn this morning is a hymn about this entire season that sums up you know, everything about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and points us to the ultimate victory, His resurrection uh, and, and the eternal life He offers. We're going to join together to sing hymn 419, Savior, when in dust to Thee. Let's stand as we sing.
divine service setting three uh, begins on page 184, 184. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty, oh, oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor and miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your humble mercy, and for the sake of Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you for all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. From the deceitful and unjust man deliver me. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. Continue on page 193, 193. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, by your great goodness, mercifully look upon your people that we may be governed and preserved evermore in body and soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. We turn our attentions now uh, to... Uh, the readings of Holy Scripture uh, for today. If you're wanting to uh, follow along in the Pew Bibles uh, with the readings, uh, you can find this morning's Old Testament reading on page 767, uh, 767. 
That will bring you to Jeremiah chapter 31. If you've ever read the book of Jeremiah, you, you might know that it is a book of almost unremitting gloom and doom. Uh, Jeremiah was sent to God's people at a very dark time in their history. Uh, the message that he has is of, of judgment and uh, the impending exile of God's people. But he also has little snippets of very good news, and this is one of them. The promise of a new covenant, a new relationship between God and his people, a covenant based upon forgiveness and, uh, and a, a more intimate connection between God and his people. We begin reading a chapter uh, 31, verse 31. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. If you're following along in the Pew Bible, our uh, second reading is from the letter to the Hebrews, and you'll find it on page 1163. The letter to the Hebrews was written to Jewish Christians who were very steeped in their knowledge of the Old Testament and uh, in the uh, things that were important in the Old Testament. And one of the very important things in the Old Testament was the priesthood, um, those who served in the Lord's temple. And uh, the writer uh, wants us to know that uh, Jesus is the great high priest uh, who does not have to offer a sacrifice for his own sins, uh, but has come to offer the supreme sacrifice for our sins. We begin reading at uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1. Every high priest is selected from among men and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. No one takes this honor upon himself. He must be called by God just as Aaron was. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, you are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We're going to hear our anthem now. If you're wanting to uh, turn in the Pew Bible to the next reading, it's on page 190, but before we get to that, uh, Claude and Lauren are going to sing In Christ Alone, but not the In Christ Alone you think they're going to sing. This is a different one. In Christ Alone, will I glory, though I 
I could pride myself in battles won, for I've been blessed beyond measure, and by his strength alone I overcome. Oh, I could stop and count successes like diamonds in my hand. But those trophies are not equal to the grace by which I stand. In Christ alone I place my trust and find my glory in the power of the cross. In every victory let it be said of me, my source of strength, my source of hope is Christ alone. In Christ alone will I glory, for only by His grace I am redeemed. And only His precious mercy could reach beyond my weakness and my need. No, I could see no greater honor than just to know Him more. But to count my gains as losses to the glory of my Lord. For Christ alone I place my trust and find my glory in the power of the cross. In every victory let it be said source of strength, my source of hope is Christ alone. In every victory let it be said of me, my source of strength, my source of hope is Christ alone. As you're able, I invite you to stand for the gospel reading. We will just uh, speak uh, the responses that are uh, in the hymnal uh, this morning. Uh, the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. They were on their way up to Jerusalem, with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, Let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Oh, we can, they answered. Jesus said to them, 
you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to the Lord Christ. We remain standing and joined together to confess our faith. We use the words this morning of the Nicene Creed, and you will find that on page 191 in the front part of the hymnal or just inside the back cover, whichever is easiest. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated, and we will turn now to our next hymn, number 430. My song is Love Unknown, and we will sing the first four verses of this hymn, uh, verses 1 to 4.
each and every one of you God's grace and mercy and peace through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We are going to uh, focus our attention this morning on the gospel reading that we heard a few moments ago. Jesus and the disciples are on the road up to Jerusalem. Even though they were traveling down from Nazareth because they were going south, they were going up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a city on a hill. Everybody went up to Jerusalem. And even if Jerusalem had been set in a valley, people probably still would have said they were going up. Because Jerusalem was the chief city. It was the center of Jewish life, of Jewish faith, and Jewish hope. It was the city that David had established to be the capital centuries before. It was the city in which Solomon had built the temple. It was the place where everything happened, and even after the city had been destroyed at the time of the Babylonian exile, when the people came back, the first thing to be built was Jerusalem. And maybe it was because they were going up to Jerusalem that Jesus' disciples began to think about that word, up, and maybe even began to apply that word to themselves. Maybe we will go up. Up as in upward mobility. Up as in getting a good position out of all of this that we are going through here as we travel our way to Jerusalem. Jesus tells the disciples at the beginning of our reading that this trip to Jerusalem is going to be a little bit different than any of the other trips that they had made to Jerusalem in the past. He's pretty blunt with them. This isn't the first time they've heard this, but he needs to tell them again. He says, see, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered into, over to the chief priests and the scribes. They will condemn him to death, deliver him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And, on, and after three days, he will rise. Important announcement. But one of the common factors of every time Jesus makes this announcement, the disciples respond in a way that indicates they didn't get any of this. It's easy for us to kind of look back on them and say, well, how dumb could you be? But, but we live on the other side of those events. We can look back on them. There are all kinds of reasons they didn't really get it. We won't go into all of that here this morning. The proof, however, that they didn't really get it comes in what happens next. Just having heard this dire prediction that Jesus is going to suffer all of these things and die and uncertain what this means about rising again. What could he be talking about there? James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come to Jesus and they say, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask you. Well, that's quite a request, isn't it? I'd like you to do for me whatever we ask. It's tempting for us to go, I mean, how can you, how do you, 
say that to Jesus of all people. But it is, in a sense, the primordial prayer. We want God to do the things we ask God to do. If we didn't want him to do it, we wouldn't be asking. Do for us whatever we want. And perhaps surprisingly, Jesus doesn't just brush them off and go, well, yeah, 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 whatever. He engages them in a conversation. Okay, uh, what do you want? And out comes the real request. They want one to sit at his right and the other at his left in glory. They want the good seats. They want to be right beside Jesus, one on either side. James on the right, John on the left, John on the right, James on the left, doesn't matter to them. One at the right, one at the left, right beside Jesus. Well, that's nothing if not ambitious. It's a huge ambition. They want to be right there. They're successful people. They were successful fishermen with their father in the business. They had left Jesus to follow him, and they want to follow him all the way to the top. Now, we learn a little bit later that the other disciples were indignant with the brothers for making this request. I would suggest that their indignance does not come over the fact that James and John had asked to sit at the right and the left. Their indignance probably comes from the fact that they didn't think of asking first. Because the subject of who is the greatest, who is the most important, who had the most prestige among the disciples, that was a subject of regular conversation. That's the sort of thing they talked about as they journeyed on the road to Jerusalem. It was what they talked about at the supper together with Jesus just before he was arrested. It's always, always on their mind. Where do they rank up? Where are they in relationship to other people? Who is the greatest? Who is the least? Who is in the middle? And while it's easy for us to sit back today and be somewhat indignant about those disciples having that same, that request, when we're really honest with ourselves, we aren't altogether different than they were. Where we fit in life's pecking order is as relevant a question for you and me today as it was for James and John and the rest of the disciples 2,000 years ago. We live in a world that backs winners, and we all want to be close to the winner. If we're not the winner, him or herself, we want to be close to that person, or we want that idea to be our idea. We set out our visions, we set out our values, we do all of these things because we have an ambition to move ahead in whatever way it is that we define moving ahead. Maybe it's getting that promotion at work, maybe it's achieving a certain status in society, maybe it's uh, working in the church for X number of years, maybe it's serving in as many volunteer positions as we possibly can. Uh, we, we, we all have these things that we are ambitious to achieve, to have our family turn out okay, to pe have people look at us and go, okay, they're solid and good people, I want to be like them. There's nothing wrong with having ambition. Jesus is going to rely on the ambitions of the disciples before too long to go out and spread his kingdom. Where the problem comes, however, is that when that becomes our sole focus or our overwhelming focus in life, 
we become like James and John, who clearly had given this some thought. Other Gospels uh, tell us that the request actually came from their mother in the first instance. So this had maybe been inculcated into them along the way that they were just a cut above the rest and should be treated likewise. They imbibe in something that Luther would years later call a theology of glory, a theology that looks to God to give us what we want right now, to give us very tangible, hands-on evidence that we are His, that we are special to Him, that we have a special relationship with Him that others may not have. And it's something that lives very much within each and every one of us. Inside you and inside me, there's a little son of Zebedee somewhere uh, telling you that you should be getting more. Or God should be giving you this. Inside each and every one of us is what Luther would call a little theologian of glory that wants God to give us the stuff we need right now, some visible, clear manifestation that we are special, a cut above the rest. We don't necessarily need to sit at the right or the left, but at least to know that we are His. But that's not exactly the way Jesus sees things. He turns to the brothers. He doesn't scold them particularly. He doesn't chew them out. He's heard this sort of thing before, and he will hear it again. And he says to them, are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am about to be baptized. In asking that question, Jesus is hitting right at the core of what it is that he has come to Jerusalem to experience. He has come to Jerusalem not to sit at the banquet tables of the great, enjoy a lavish feast with the power brokers, and the movers and the shakers of Jerusalem. He's come instead to drink another cup. The cup of wrath. In the Old Testament, the cup is often used as an image of God's anger. God's anger at human sinfulness. God's anger at human pride and human self-centeredness. And he has come to drink that cup and drink it to the very dregs. And he says to the disciples, can you drink this cup? Can you be baptized with a baptism that I am going to be baptized with? And the baptism he's referring to here is not his baptism in the Jordan River with John and all the lovely things that happened on that day. He's referring instead to baptism in the same sense that the earth was baptized in the days of Noah and the flood where sin was wiped out or as the Egyptians were baptized, if you will, in the Red Sea. Water is another symbol often of God's wrath and destruction in the Old Testament. These are the things that he's coming to Jerusalem to experience. And he says to them, can you drink this? And naively they go, oh, yeah, yeah, we're right up to that. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Well, you remember what happened, right? When all of this stuff started unfolding, when the cup was before Jesus and he's lay, praying there in the garden and sweat is coming off of him like blood and he's praying, Father, you know, let this cup pass from me. And Peter and James and John, they're having a little nap. Oh yeah, they're up to this, all right. Yeah, we can drink this all down for sure. Oh yeah, no problem at all. And then when he's arrested, they are like, you know, rats off the Titanic, nowhere to be found, gone, run, flee for your life, get out of here. Well, indeed, John would make an appearance at the cross, but 
it was probably pretty tentative and pretty fearful. He's come to take on himself what we could never, never take on because this is his ambition. His ambition, and he tells it to us in a sentence at the end of the reading, is not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. His whole idea of mobility is not upward mobility, but if you will, a downward mobility. The Gentiles, they want to lord it over you and they want to have officers and authorities and positions and all this sort of stuff. Not so among you, he said. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. He comes to be the servant that we've been talking about in our Wednesday Lenten services, the servant who has no particular form or majesty that anyone should be attracted to him, the servant who... um, is, is, is not particularly remarkable, not a worldly figure in any way, shape, or form, a servant who comes to be the lamb that takes the sins of the world upon himself, the servant who doesn't even raise his voice in self-defense, but the servant through whom we are healed, healed of our sometimes very, very askew ambitions. Because among his disciples, it is not to be the way it is in the world, where it is dog-eat-dog and climb and scratch and do everything you can to get to the top. It's different. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And that, dear friends, is our ambition. That, indeed, is what we were baptized into. That is the cup we drink. We were baptized into his death so that we might die to sin day by day, and rise again in repentance to live as children of God, whose goal is not to rise up some ladder, but to care for the people around us. To love those who are hard to love, to reach out to those who are difficult. We drink the cup, as we will in a few minutes, Not the cup of God's wrath, that's already been drunk for us, but the cup of the servant who has given his life for you and for me and who now serves you and me at his table so that we might have his life in us and go out into the world, not worrying too much about where we end up in the overall pecking order of things, only that we serve because his ambition becomes our ambition. Not to sit at the right or left of the Lord. That's all figured out already and those who are supposed to sit there will sit there. But to be as the Son of Man who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God which passes all our human understanding keep our hearts and our minds in true faith to life everlasting. Amen. We remain standing as we join together to sing the offertory, Create in Me. It's on page 192.
Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, pour out your Holy Spirit and write your word upon our hearts that we may know you as the God who forgives our sins and remembers our iniquities no more. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, your Son came not to be served, but to serve. Help us not, Lord, our authority over one another, but humbly serve one another in our homes, in our communities, and in our congregation as Christ has so humbly served us. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, look with mercy upon our Prime Minister, our Premier, the mayors of our cities, and all other earthly authorities. Guard them from the temptation to wield their power improperly and lead them to serve faithfully according to your good and gracious will. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, as your only begotten Son learned obedience through what he suffered, We pray that you would instruct, bless, and relieve your servants who look to you for healing and strength. Continue to be with Linda Ebel in palliative care, Pastor Zabel as he recovers from knee surgery, Deb Hutflutz, Dan Marshall, and baby Matthew Benjamin in palliative care also. Sustain them as they walk the way of the cross with your son, that they may know the fullness of his eternal salvation Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, your Son stands before you as our great high priest. By your Spirit, prepare our hearts to worthily receive the body and blood of our Savior, who is sacrificed for us on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray. Trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated for a few parish announcements. Which are not here. Um, I'll do my best. Welcome again to worship this morning. It's good to have you here. A reminder, if you're near the center aisle, to fill in the friendship pad before you uh, leave this morning so we know you were here. If you're online and have a Gmail account and don't mind signing in, uh, we're happy to know that you were part of our service as well. Uh, Two weeks from today is Easter. Uh, The Holy Week schedule is in your bulletin, and we encourage you to be involved in the services of Holy Week. A reminder, too, that the Easter breakfast is coming back uh, in in a more fulsome form than we've had it the last couple of years, and uh, 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 we're looking for muffins. And uh, if you can bring some muffins, um, please sign up. There's a little table down the hallway by the elevator, uh, and if you could fill that in, people would be very thankful uh, for that. Um, Also, we continue to worship again on Wednesday. Somehow that did not get into the bulletin this week. That's probably my fault. Um, uh, uh, With our Wednesday Lent service at 1.30, the soup supper at uh, 6, and then again at 7 p.m. as we continue to work our way through Isaiah's fourth servant song about the suffering Savior. Uh, And then lastly, in the bulletin this morning, there are a number of save the date uh, in regard to our 75th anniversary. And uh, there's an organ recital coming, a Sunday where uh, some sons of the congregation will come back to lead our worship service and then the big celebration weekend at the end of May. All more details will come in weeks ahead, um, but we just want to get the word out now that those are important dates uh, as we uh, move into a time of celebrating God's blessings on our congregation. That's about it, excuse me, for parish announcements this morning. Uh, As you're able, I invite you to stand as our offerings are presented. I will just, before I present the offerings, uh, 
<clears throat> make a quick announcement in regard to communion this morning. Even though I'm a bit more mobile today than I've been the last uh, several weeks, I'm still not going to participate in the distribution uh, of communion this morning. So if there are young people or folks who are not communing um, uh, and wish to receive a blessing, please be sure to be quite deliberate about that sign so that uh, those who are uh, distributing uh, are aware. Thank you. We give you but your own, and any gift we bring, all that we have is yours alone, a trust from you, our King. Continue with the communion liturgy in the hymnal. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many, so that with cleansed hearts we might be prepared to celebrate joyfully the Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying. in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please stand. We continue with the communion liturgy on page 201. Page 201. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we ask you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same, to live always in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. We remain standing as we join together to sing our closing hymn, number 806, Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart. 